Are you ready for the word? Let's begin by quickly rewinding what we have learned in the last few weeks in this particular series. We began by talking about how God is for us. Then we studied about the gift of Jesus. The third week we studied the mighty weapons that is available for us uh, because we have Jesus. And last weekend we were studying about how the devil is disarmed and how we can make sure that the devil continues to stay disarmed. Now we're going to continue from verse 34. Romans chapter 8 verse 34 says, Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. Now I want to talk to you about death. You know, in the world that we see around us, death is causing fear, panic, and it is shutting down businesses, destroying marriages. Uh, you know, it's almost causing the entire world to come to a halt because everybody is afraid of death. Now, the world looks at death as a very negative thing, as a loss, as something that we miss out on if somebody dies. And, and that's true in a sense, because death is loss. Physically speaking, death is loss. But that is where the death of Jesus stands different to all the other deaths that we see around us. The death of Jesus was the only death which is completely and a hundred percent a victory and not a loss. It was not a defeat. It was something that brought victory to all of humanity. So let's meditate upon that. To do that, we would go back to the Garden of Eden where the word death comes for the very first time. Reading Genesis chapter 2 and verse 16 and 17, God said to Adam and Eve, God was in fact warning them, He said, You may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. God was giving them a boundary and saying, you can eat everything else, but don't touch this particular tree. If you touch this tree, you are sure to die. Physically, spiritually, emotionally, in your relationship with each other, in your finances, in your ability to uh, have dominion over all of creation, you are going to die. And God's original plan was for them to live forever. And yet, at this particular point, because they disobeyed, and they went outside of God's boundaries. They went outside of the principles, the, the limits that the Lord had laid around them. They went outside the protection of life. And that's how death was introduced into all of humanity. Paul says this very beautifully in Romans chapter 6 verse 23. He says, the wages of sin is death. And all of us have sinned. There's nobody who has not sinned. Romans 3 verse 23 says, For everyone has sinned and we all fall short of God's glorious standard. That is what brought death into humanity. Sin is what brought death. Disobedience is what brought death. Uh, causing displeasure to God, bringing a lifestyle of rebellion against God, living in a way that doesn't honor God. That is what brought death into the whole world because God is the author of life. You cannot live in rebellion with the author of life and expect to continue to live, expect to continue to prosper. You and I, we are going to die. And the Bible talks about the solution that God gave humanity. Now, death was a permanent problem because sin is a permanent problem. And when God looked at uh, this problem, God said, I need to give them a solution. And that's the portion that we are going to study today. Uh, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, he said, I will cause hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. This is in fact prophetic about the death of Jesus. And something crazy happened at the death of Jesus. It's talking about how Jesus crushed the head of the serpent. And all that the enemy could do, all that the serpent could do was bite his heel or 
hurt his heel. Now, what is more damaging? You know, when we look at life and when we see the death of Jesus, we may look at it as, uh, wow, this is, this is the end. This was a defeat or this was a sad thing. This is something Jesus lost. How cool would it have been if Jesus would have remained alive all throughout eternity, all throughout, uh, you know, the history of humanity. But what Jesus was accomplishing by his death was that he was receiving that hurt on his heel in order to be able to crush the serpent's head with that same heel that was being hurt. Now, Jesus is the only one who qualified to do this because everybody else that was born of Eve, that was born of Adam and Eve, were sinners. Everybody had fallen short of God's glorious standard. There were many anointed and, and amazing people that lived in the history of the Bible. Adam had a son called Abel and God loved Abel. After Abel came Enoch uh, much later and Enoch walked with God and God loved him because of his desire for God's presence. And after that came Noah. God enjoyed Noah's fellowship. And after Noah came Abraham and Job and so many great men and women of God that walked with God, that loved God, that served God, feared God. And still in all of them, there was this essence of sin. So none of them could actually fulfill the prophecy in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. And so that is why God sent his only begotten son. And he sent him in such a way that he will come when he is born into the world. He will be born pure and holy. Let's read of this scripture. Luke chapter 1 and verse 35. You remember what I said initially that it was not death, but it was sin, which was the real problem. Sin is what caused death. Now here is somebody being born and he is being born without sin. Luke chapter 1 verse 35, the angel came to Mary and he uh, told Mary, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you so the baby to be born will be holy and he will be called the son of God. This is prophetic about Jesus' birth. And he says that this baby that is going to be born in your womb, he's not going to be born because of a human relationship. Because if he is going to be born of a human relationship, it will carry the genes and the sin of human lineage and again like everybody else will not be able to redeem the whole world from sin and so the, this baby that is going to be born this baby is going to be conceived of the holy spirit and this child is going to be holy from the moment it is conceived and it says and he will be called the son of god capital s son which means he was also god and throughout his life the bible talks about how he lived his life in the first 12 years in the first 30 years till the day that he died in the 33rd year of his life first peter chapter 2 and verse 22 it says he never sinned nor ever deceived anyone in fact, this was prophesied of him in Isaiah 53 and Peter who had witnessed Jesus' life. He is writing a memoir and he's saying he never sinned. This Jesus that was conceived by the Holy Spirit and lived a pure life, he never sinned and he never deceived anyone. Now, let me tell you Jesus' testimony about himself. What is Jesus saying about his own life? Let's read that. John chapter 8 and verse 29. And the one who sent me is with me. He has not deserted me. For I always do what pleases him. Jesus is talking about his relationship with the father. And he says that he always does what pleases the father. This is the definition of sin. Sin is not about us not drinking particular substance and not smoking particular things and doing the kind of things that the world defines as bad behavior. Sin is 
living a life that is not conscious of pleasing the father. Jesus, he lived in a way that he wanted to please the father at all times. Now, if you have to inspect your life and if I have to inspect my life just in the last one week, I know that I have not lived 100% desiring to please God. I have wanted to please myself. I have wanted to please the people around me. I wanted to have my ends meet and you know my uh, dreams and my goals and my ambitions come to pass. And we have not always lived with the desire to please God, to please the Father in heaven. And that's how Jesus lived. Always, not in the high moments of his life when he had a conference and the Holy Spirit came in great power. No. All the time, always he lived with his desire to please him. Not just with the desire, but he actually lived like that. That desire transpired and became actions that pleased the Father. Now let's go to Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15. This is another testimony about the entire life of Jesus, how he was tempted. It says, this high priest of ours, Jesus, he understands our weaknesses for he faced all of the same testings that we do and yet he did not sin. Jesus faced testings. Jesus faced temptations. In Luke chapter 4 it's described in detail how Jesus was tempted throughout his life on earth. He was tempted, tested, tried by so many different people and circumstances and sometimes people would come and say hey just prove to us that you are the son of God. Just give us a sign and we'll believe in you. And the devil tried all his schemes and every trap that he could throw at Jesus. He tried it and the Bible says, and yet he did not sin. Going further towards the end of Jesus' life here on earth, we, we read about how the person that condemned Jesus to death, what did he say? Let's read about that. Luke chapter 23 and verse 13, Pilate, his name was Pilate. He was the governor of Judea at that time. And then Pilate called together the leading priests and other religious leaders along with the people. And he announced his verdict. Okay, this is the official verdict about Jesus. Now, I can understand that for whatever reason, uh, Jesus was pure and holy, but the law of the land said that he was not holy. He deserved death. I could understand. But here is the law of the land is pronouncing a verdict about Jesus. This is Pilate saying, you brought this man to me, accusing him of leading a revolt. I have examined him thoroughly on this point in your presence, and I find him innocent. Pilate the governor of the land, he found that Jesus was innocent. So what did he do? He sent Jesus to Herod. Uh, and the Bible says, the next verse, Luke 23 verse 15, Herod came to the same conclusion and sent him back to us. Nothing this man has done calls for death penalty. You know, Herod was not as uh, liberal minded as Pilate was. Herod was a really wicked guy, a loving pleasure, very worldly and carnal. And even Herod himself couldn't find any fault with Jesus. He made fun of him. He put his robe on Jesus to you know, tease him and do all of that and sent him back saying, hey, I don't find anything wrong with Jesus. Please understand that there were so many false accusations that was leveled up against Jesus. And still with all of that, the rulers of the time, the leaders of the time, they said, no, I don't think that he is guilty, that he should die. Everybody said that Jesus has not done anything wrong. John chapter 19 and verse 4, Pilate went outside again and said to the people, I am going to bring him out to you now, but understand clearly that I find him not guilty. That was his verdict. Jesus is not guilty at all. Okay, reading further, Matthew chapter 27, verse 24. Pilate saw that he wasn't getting anywhere and that a riot was developing. So he sent for a bowl of water and washed his hands before the crowd saying, I am innocent 
of this man's blood the responsibility is yours and after that he handed jesus over to them and and said you can do whatever you want you can crucify him because he said i am not responsible i cannot uh, take the responsibility of condemning this man and he washed his hands off and he said i i know for a fact that this man is not guilty that this man is not uh, deserving of death now the only thing that the people could probably point to jesus and and probably uh, find a fault in him was that jesus claimed to be the son of god was that jesus claimed equality with god and that that was not wrong because jesus was god himself he uh, was conceived of god on, on this earth but it was not on this earth that he was born it was just his human incarnation the bible says that jesus existed from the very beginning when god the father made all heaven and earth it was through jesus that everything was made so jesus was there right from the beginning and god the father and god the son jesus and god the holy spirit made everything that was there in community in in union with each other they have always been one and and that is why jesus could claim equality with god and there was not sin that is the only thing that they proved as a charge against him and they said we have to kill jesus and in all of this let me read another scripture i hope that you're taking notes of these scriptures uh, 1 john chapter 3 and verse 5 and you know that jesus came to take away our sins and that there is no sin in him this jesus he because he came to take away our sin he couldn't be a person who was also equally sinful he had to be somebody that would not sin would not touch sin would not taste sin at all and the bible says that he came to take away our sin and that there is no sin in him at all second corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21 for god made christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with god through christ when jesus died on the cross when jesus was condemned to die he was not condemned to die for his own sin throughout scriptures we see this that he did not die for himself he died for us his death was an offering for our sin because there was no sin in him but all of humanity has sinned all of humanity has fallen short of god's glory all of humanity deserves death and here is this one person in all of human history that doesn't deserve death and yet is being condemned to die by the ones that do deserve to death and the bible reveals the mystery and he says hey he did not die for himself he did not die for his own sins he died for your sins and my sins our sins deserved death and he took that punishment he he sacrificed himself as an offering for our sin why because the wages of sin is death if we have to escape eternal death if we have to escape eternal punishment if we have to escape eternal fire then we have to receive this jesus into our life it says when we experience this jesus when we welcome this jesus into our life that we can that we can be made right with god because of jesus that is what jesus did how could jesus do that he could do that because he did not sin now that is why i said that the death of jesus was different from the death of anybody else that lived on this planet when somebody dies it may be a loss it may be a defeat but when jesus died that was a victory that was not lost that was profit for all of humanity that is why i have titled this morning's word as victory in death this morning we can experience this more than conquerors spirit we can be more than conquerors we can experience victory in every dimension of life because jesus who did not deserve to die he died on 
our behalf. Jesus who did not have sin, Jesus who did not have any reasons to be defeated, got defeated on the cross. He, he laid down his life on the cross so that we can be more than conquerors. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 18 and 19, a couple of scriptures that is worth memorizing. The Bible says, for you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life that you inherited from your ancestors. And it was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. This offering that we are talking about, that was uh, given so that we can live, so that we don't have to die like Jesus died, so that we don't have to be disconnected from God, so that we don't have to live our lives in shame and condemnation. This offering was not paid by gold or silver because everything loses value. You know, we're living in a day and a time when uh, the markets are crashing. The things that we thought are the most valuable, it will never lose its value, are now losing value. And nobody wants those things anymore. And people are all running after things that, that are going to save their life, that are going to protect them from death. And here is the assurance given that it is not gold or silver that is going to protect you. It says it is the precious blood of Jesus Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. That is the blood with which we were purchased. That is the blood that was given as an offering on our behalf. Now, this morning as I'm talking to you, some of you will look at this and say, no, all of this is nonsense. All of this is useless. This is not something that I want to subscribe to. This is not a thought pattern or belief system that I agree with. And I understand where you come from. Uh, you may be thinking that you're good enough or, or that you, you, know, you don't really deserve to die. But look at the world around you. Look at everything that we are experiencing and everything that we are going through. And and the only thing that can stop this, the only thing that can turn the world around is when you and I will trust in the precious blood of Jesus. And in fact, Jesus is coming back. And when he does come back, he is going to establish his kingdom all over the world in literal physical form and the bible talks about that world and he says there is going to be no sickness then there is going to be no death there is going to be no pain there is going to be no sorrow and we will rule and reign with him for eternity and for us to experience that we have to be washed with this precious blood of christ the sinless spotless uh, lamb of god the sinless spotless blood of Jesus. That is what will cleanse us. Paul talks about how we can view the death of Jesus. You know, we can see it as a victory or we can see it as defeat. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 22 he says, It is foolish to the Jews who ask for signs from heaven and it is foolish to the Greeks who seek human wisdom. You know, Jews were the ones that were saying, hey, something miraculous should happen now. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, they actually came and said to him, Hey, try to get off the cross and then we will believe in you. And for Greeks, for the ones that were not Jews, they, they were like, Hey, um, this doesn't make sense. This is not logical. This is not rational. They were seeking human wisdom. It didn't make sense to them that Jesus dying on the cross can help save me from my sin. You know, that, that doesn't make any sense. That's not how the world's economy works. That's not how the world's uh, system of law and justice work. If, if you sin, you die, not somebody else. And, and so it didn't make sense to both of them. But it says, uh, so when we preach that Christ was crucified, the Jews are offended and the Gentiles say it's all nonsense. Uh, the Jews think that, you know, man, you guys are um, hurting our religious sentiments. And the, and the Gentiles, they're like, you know, this is just pure nonsense. But verse 24, it says, But to those that are called by God to salvation, they may be both Jews or Gentiles, 
Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Now that is what I believe is happening to some of you that are watching me this morning. I know that many people would have gotten offended by what I shared. Many people would have called it nonsense and tuned off. But there are a few of you who are looking at this and he's saying, hey, hey, this makes sense. And I need this. I need to put my trust in this Jesus. I need redemption for my sins. I need forgiveness for my sins. I need a fresh start. I need a new beginning in my life. I need to get rid of the pain and the challenges and all the things that, that I have done to hurt others and all the hurts that I have experienced. I want to get rid of that in my life. But to those that are called by God to salvation, it may be Jew or a Gentile, Christ is the power and the wisdom of God. This morning as you're listening to me, the power of God is flowing through this video. The power of God is flowing through this audio. Wherever you are listening or watching, the power of God is going to touch your body, it is going to touch your mind, it is going to touch your spirit and it is going to release heavenly wisdom, things that didn't make sense to you, things that you didn't understand till now will automatically begin to make sense to you right now. If you will just yield to this power, if you will just yield to this grace, you are going to experience this awesome power and this awesome wisdom that is going to just come upon you and give you new revelations, new understanding. And your eyes are going to open up to see spiritual realities. You're going to start seeing things from God's perspective. You're going to become spiritually alive this morning. You are going to be transformed if you are going to put your faith in Jesus. You have three options. You can either be offended by what I'm sharing or you can just ignore what I'm sharing or you can believe that what I'm sharing is for you. And if you're believing that with us, make sure to write to us in the comments or take our email IDs and just write to us. It'll come on your screen. Just let us know where you're watching from. And we would love to take you through this journey of knowing and walking with Jesus because he is the power of God available for you and he is the wisdom of God. Now, how can we experience this power and wisdom? Let me give you three tips before I finish today. Romans chapter 6 and verse 3. There is an invitation for you and me to join in the death of Jesus. There are three ways in which we can do it. The first thing is this. Have you forgotten when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his death. The first way, the first tip, the first entry point to be able to experience what Jesus accomplished for us on the cross is for us to get baptized. The Bible talks about how when we get baptized in water, we are in fact joining Jesus in his death. Do you want to be part of what Jesus accomplished for you? then you do not have to die physically on the cross, but you do have to get baptized. Go find a church. Go find a friend that can help you. If you are in Bangalore or around us, write to us and we would love to help you do this. Baptism, what happens when you get baptized is that you have died and your old self is being buried into the waters. And when you come out, you come out as a completely different person. And, and there is a process of regeneration that happens. You know, when a child is conceived in the mother's womb, for the first nine months, the child remains in fluid, in water, in, in a, a liquid atmosphere. And it is there that the child is born. The invisible hand of God is upon the child and he is forming the inward parts of the baby. And nine months later, we see it in reality. And the same way, when you get baptized, when you go into the water, you are being reformed. The hand of God is coming into the same waters and your spiritual life is being reformed and you're going to come out with a new life. So the first thing that you need to do to acknowledge the death of Jesus in your life 
is for you to get baptized wherever you are. You may be a Christian for a long time. You may have been sprinkled baptized or forced baptized or adult baptized. But if you did not truly believe in Jesus till now, if you did not really put your faith in Jesus till now, then that baptism is not valid. Baptism is valid only when you have put your faith in Jesus. And that is the kind of baptism that is unifying you to the death of Jesus Christ. The second thing that you can do is what Paul did. Paul says in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10, I want to suffer with him sharing in his death. Paul was talking about a lifestyle of living for Jesus. He says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. A lifestyle of daily dying, daily sacrificing, daily suffering. Sometimes physically, sometimes emotionally, sometimes relationally, sometimes financially. Things that I have to give up on, things that I have to sacrifice so that I can live for Jesus. So that I can live to please Him. Like Jesus lived to please the Father. You and I have to live to please Jesus. And in this journey, there are things that we may have have to give up on. There are things that we may have to sacrifice on. And Paul says, that is how I want to live. I want to live a life of perpetual sacrifice. I want to suffer with him and sharing in his death. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 17, um, we're going to read the third way. Uh, it says, and since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, Together with Christ, we are the heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. So what he's saying is, we have a inheritance. We are co-heirs with Jesus Christ and we can experience this glory as Jesus experienced. And if we have to experience that, we have to be willing to experience the sufferings that he experienced. What was the suffering that he experienced? Not just physical suffering. There were several temptations that he had to withstand, several things that he had to say no to. And that is the kind of suffering that we have to go through. And we have to say no to the temptations, no to the, uh, the invitation that the world gives us. And the Bible says when we do that, we will be partakers of his glory. How do we take part of his glory? Let me read these scriptures out and, and I hope that this will be the third thing that will bring um, a revelation to you. The first thing is getting baptized. The second thing is living a life of daily sacrifice, living a life of daily suffering, uh, giving up your pleasures, giving up your desires, giving up your needs. And here is the third thing. When we suffer with him, we will also be able to reign with him. We will be able to rule with him. And how do we rule with him? This is what the Bible says. The book of Luke chapter 22 and verse 19. Jesus, he took some bread. This is just before he was about to be arrested. He says, he took some bread and he gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took another cup of wine and said, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. There are two things that Jesus did. He first broke the bread and he said, this bread, it's representing my body, which is given for you, which is broken for you. Today, the body of Jesus also represents the church, which is supposed to be a blessing for you. And he says, this is given for you. I died on the cross. My body was broken. My body had stripes. All of this was for your healing, for your salvation. So the third way in which you and I can experience the death of Jesus is by breaking bread regularly. And when he's talking about the wine, he says, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people. See, there was a previous covenant that existed that the people of God celebrated all throughout centuries before Jesus came. 
And that was called the festival of Passover. That was the covenant that God had made with Moses. And he said, hey, as long as you do this, uh, as long as you remember, as long as you keep this festival, you know, you are going to have favor with me and I'm going to have uh, mercy upon you. And here is Jesus saying, now I'm, I'm establishing a new covenant. Because this is not about the old covenant anymore. Now this is something that has been sealed with my blood. This is not a temporary covenant. The other, other covenant, every year they had to kill animals. Every year they had to shed blood. But this was a permanent solution once and for all. What Jesus did for us. And he says, this is a new covenant that is being confirmed right now between heaven and earth. This cup it represents that new covenant and it is confirmed with my blood which is poured out as a sacrifice for you if you read the later verses it says luke chapter 22 verse 29 he is explaining the benefits of taking the bread and the wine and he says you've been with me in my trial in verse 28 uh, what he's saying is when you're taking part of the bread and the wine you are actually becoming one with my broken body and my shed blood you have become one you have unified yourself with my death and now because you have gone through the suffering in your heart in your mind when you've remembered what i have gone through because you have gone through all of that verse 29 he says just as my father has granted me a kingdom I now grant you the right, verse 30 says, I grant you the right to eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and you will sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Jesus was specifically speaking to the 12 disciples and he's saying, you guys, you're going to rule over the 12 tribes of Israel. And today he is speaking to us, all those that are still taking this bread and wine and are willing to become one with the death, with the body and the blood of Jesus. Jesus is looking at us and he's saying, the same right that my father gave me when I died on the cross, the same kingdom that I received, that the father granted me, I now give you the right to eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and as a result of that you are going to rule you're going to judge you're going to have dominion in the world around you now we are living in a world where you know this pandemic seems to have the ultimate dominion but let me tell you when we experience what jesus has accomplished for us on the cross by taking part of the bread and the wine by coming in union with what Jesus declared for us on the cross, what Jesus uh, purchased for us on the cross through his blood and through his body. I'm telling you, we are not just experiencing his suffering, but we are also, because of his suffering, we are also experiencing the glory that he is giving us. What is his glory? This open invitation to come and eat at his table in his kingdom and his kingdom is already here on the earth and it is our job and our responsibility to declare and to unleash his dominion in the world around us. And when we take part of the bread and the wine, one thing that we are declaring to ourselves and the world around us is that the kingdom of God is here and we are the ones that are going to rule. We are the ones that are going to speak and things are going to shift and things are going to change. That is the power of of communion the next the next and the last scripture for today is from psalm 23 and verse 5 uh, this is the psalm of david and he says like this you prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies you honor me by anointing my head with oil and my cup it overflows with blessings you you see the feast that is for eating and the cup that is for drinking and he says hey this is what god is doing for me in this season he is preparing a feast for me in the presence of my enemies i may be surrounded by pandemics i may be surrounded by enemies i may be surrounded by things that uh, don't like me things that is looking like you know my 
end is near, the world's end is near, and community is end is near. And yet in the presence of all of this, my God, my shepherd, my father, he has prepared a feast for me in the midst of all of it. And this fe feast is going to lead me into a place where I am going to be anointed on my head with fresh oil. This anointing is going to protect me. This anointing is going to guard me. This anointing is going to keep me safe. And it says that my cup, it overflows with blessings. I will have no lack. I will have no need. I may be surrounded by enemies, but this is my portion. Because I'm sitting at his table, because I am eating at his table, because I am in his kingdom. I'm not in the kingdom of this world. I'm not ruled and governed by the systems and the patterns of this world. I live by the kingdom standards of heaven. And because of that, I have the grace to rule over my enemies in the world around me. So three things, let me just rewind them once again. Three ways in which you can become one with the death of Jesus. The first thing, make sure to get baptized. The second thing, make sure to live a daily life of uh, building an altar and laying yourself down on the altar. Just dying to yourself, sharing in the death of Jesus, like Paul says in uh, Philippians chapter 3. And the third thing is to take part in the communion. Because when you take part in communion, you're not just remembering the death and, and the sufferings of Jesus, you are also declaring to the world around you that now you are seated in a place of honor. Now you are seated in a place of dominion. Now you are seated in a place of authority. And God has prepared a feast for us in the presence of our enemies. And he is honoring us by anointing our head with oil. And that our cup, it overflows with blessings because this is a cup that sealed the new covenant that is made between heaven and earth. I pray that this will become a revelation to you, wherever you are. Just join with me and let's pray. Father, may your wisdom, may your power be released to your children. Lord, help us to truly experience the fullness of the victory that you have won for us on the cross. You did not deserve to die. You never committed a sin and yet they condemned you to sin. And it was not for your sake that you died. You died for my sake. Uh, you died to redeem me, to take away all my sins, to be an offering for my sins, God. And I also know that today I can take part of your death by getting baptized, by by sharing in the sufferings that you went through, by saying no to temptations, by saying no to myself, by saying no to my desires, I can share in that sufferings and, and in doing that I can be one with you. And when I share in your sufferings, I also receive the glory and I can experience that glory by taking part in the Lord's table, by taking part of the feast that you have prepared for me and the and the cup that you have prepared for me because this this feast it represents the body of Jesus this bread it represents the body of Jesus and this cup it represents the blood of Jesus Lord I pray that your children wherever they are watching they will experience the victory that is available for us in the death of Jesus Christ we love you and we celebrate you in Jesus name we pray Amen.